Welcome to the Growth Cap Podcast, where we chat with CEOs, investors, and other key industry leaders to uncover insights and strategies for accelerating growth, succeeding in business. I am your host, RJ Lumba. In this episode, we chat with Nahal Raj, a partner at TPG, which is a leading global alternative asset firm founded in 1992 with approximately $83 billion of assets under management. Nahal co-leads the firm's investment activities in software and enterprise technology across its private equity platforms, TPG Capital, TPG Tech Adjacencies, TPG Growth, and the Rise Fund. Nahal shares with us the investment themes he's currently most focused on, as well as some of the keys to TPG's success over the years. Today, the firm's investment platforms span a wide range of asset classes, including private equity, growth equity, real estate, impact investing, and public equity. TPG aims to build dynamic products and options for its investors, while also instituting discipline and operational excellence across the investment strategy and performance of its portfolio. We hope you enjoy the show. So Nahal, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us today and congratulations on your award for one of the top 25 software investors of 2020. You're always a crowd favorite in terms of the CEO community, as well as the investor peer community. So maybe what we could do to kick off is if you could give us a little bit of a background on TPG for those in our audience who aren't as familiar, as well as some background on yourself. Happy to. Thanks. On me personally, this is my 15th year at uh, TPG focused on technology investing. And it's been about 20 years in total doing private equity focused on the technology space. I think, as you know, tech is one of the most active investment areas for TPG, and it has been really from the beginning. I think it's something like over the last 10 years or so, we've invested around $10 billion of, of equity across the sector. The firm has a pretty unique setup. We are able to invest across both growth equity and buyouts across a single investment team. And that's a pretty unique way of going about investing in the tech sector. It allows us to see companies that are in thematic areas of focus for us, but that we can range that from small disruptive companies to large incumbent companies, and then kind of choose accordingly. And so it's a really interesting way of going about tech investing and uh, happy that we've set it up that way here Mm -hmm. at TPD. What's been incredible over the years, I mean, you mentioned the span of experience you've had for a large number of years. TPG, having been founded in in 1992, has sequentially been at the forefront of new areas to invest in. It seemed like tech has been there and very prominent in the portfolio from the very beginning. But it would be great to to hear, uh, I guess, a little bit more about, you know, how TPG, and this might get into a little bit about the framework in which you operate and maybe the culture, but, you know, how TPG is able to stay at the forefront and continually have an eye towards investing in the future? I'd say a couple of things. One is it, it does come back to this setup where we have so many different funds at TPG that address different stages of a company's life cycle. You know, I think there's many buyout funds that typically only invest in mature companies. And in fact, that was our setup for a number of years. I think what really accelerated us into this more modern era of software investing was when we started making growth equity investments in the space out of our TPG Growth, TPG Rise, and TTAD platforms that were all sort of newly developed since I joined the firm. The reason for that is, as you know, tech and software is such a dynamic industry, and you really can't be an effective, mature software investor without really having a deep understanding for what's happening at the earlier stages. And there's two ways of getting that knowledge. One is you can kind of read about companies and do some desktop research. But what we found is the more effective way of becoming an expert in the early stages is to actually make investments and look at investments because nothing trains the mind than putting capital at risk. And so because we're able to invest in early stage companies and growth stage companies, I think it's made us you know, that much more effective in the late stages. And it's also allowed us to shuck and jive a little bit in terms of investing earlier in some areas and later in others, just depending on the dynamics at the moment and also the valuation environment. So I think that's helped us stay stay nimble in what's an otherwise pretty competitive industry. 
I imagine you're seeing innovation both from kind of some of the larger software companies as well as the startups with the larger folks, you know, always trying to remain relevant and grow organically. Perhaps they're incubating new technologies within their walls. What are you most excited about? What are kind of the areas that you're seeing within software that you really like to dig in on? It's a question that's close to our hearts here because, you know, at TPG, we always start by asking ourselves sort of at the beginning of every calendar year, what are the themes that we're most interested in investing behind? Every firm has a different approach. Our approach is very theme first and opportunity second. And so we're really focused on picking just a handful of themes that we want to go deep on. And rather than cover like the entire software waterfront, but not very deeply, we'd rather pick four or five areas and go super deep in those and really leave the rest for others to do. And so I can mention a couple of those areas that we've been spending time in. One is this broad category of digital transformation. And the concept here is Fortune 500 companies, non-tech companies are quickly becoming digital companies through better use of data, better use of software. Being a tools provider to those companies, whether it's providing DevOps tools to write software or artificial intelligence tools to crunch data, we find to be sort of one of the most interesting themes and long lasting themes that we're excited about. We recently made a couple of investments in this area. One's a company called Digital AI, which is a DevOps company focused on this theme area. The other is Wind River, which we bought a couple of years ago from Intel, which is focused on edge computing and AI as well. So that's one area that we're spending a lot of time in. I would say another totally different, RJ, is healthcare IT. Healthcare and software have been two of the most active areas of investment at TPG. We have a very strong and large healthcare investment practice here at the firm. And when we look at healthcare IT investments, we do that as sort of a partnership between our healthcare industry group and our software investment team. Within that, we've been active across a number of areas. One of the most prominent has been in the post-acute side of healthcare, which is seeing a lot of volume pick up, coupled with historical lack of investment. And so one of our largest portfolio companies at the firm actually is a company called WellSky. And it's a company that we helped create to provide software to this post-acute end market that we're really excited about thematically. And the third theme area that we're really focused on is cybersecurity. I think we all are painfully aware of the threats that we're constantly under around the loss of data, the loss of sensitive information. It feels like every day those threats are getting more pronounced. And the nature of the security framework that protects us is also changing. It used to be all about appliances that sat around a network to protect us when we're sitting in office environments. But what is really needed these days is all of that security functionality uh, moving to the cloud. And so that change in a security framework and security posture is something that we are investing behind. We've made a couple of growth equity investments in this space and Zscaler, which is now a public company, Tanium, which is still private, and also McAfee out of our flagship fund, a large buyout that we, uh, we did from Intel a few years ago. That all makes a whole ton of sense. You know, digital transformation, healthcare, IT, and cybersecurity being among the focus areas. And how has you and your team been able to help CEOs scale and improve their operations? Yeah, I can give you a couple of examples because it, transforming companies is something that we take pride in. And there've been a couple of instances recently where we've been able to do that, where the company we've created is pretty unrecognizable from where we started. So one example is digital.ai, which is the DevOps platform I, I mentioned earlier. Our thesis around the DevOps space is that it's a very fragmented market, very interesting market, but very fragmented. And in talking to customers and CIOs, they all talk about wanting vendor consolidation. They'd rather buy more stuff from fewer vendors and have more integration across products. And so we thought, why not help sort of accelerate that natural process of consolidation in this industry? So we partnered with uh, a CEO named Ashok Reddy, who we hired from Broadcom. He was previously at CA before Broadcom acquired CA. And he had a lot of experience in DevOps and shared a similar point of view as us. And in partnership together, we basically, in very short order, acquired five different companies that each were category leaders in their spaces within the DevOps kind of tool chain. And we put them all together. It's still early days. We're only a year into this project, but 
we've effectively created an end-to-end platform. We renamed the whole company Digital.ai. And what it really does is it helps companies write software all the way from the planning stages of figuring out what software to write and who's going to write it, all the way to releasing and securing that code once it's you know out in the wild. Previously, you had to buy all of that from different vendors and integrate it yourself at the customer side, but we are doing that hard work for the customer and offering sort of a single platform. So that's one company that we created from really from an idea and executed on in partnership with our CEO. The other one to talk about is WellSky in the healthcare IT space. It's actually a similar thesis. This one was a few years ago. We saw a very attractive post-acute care end market that I spoke about earlier, but again, very fragmented. Each area within post-acute care, so home health agencies, hospice providers, skilled nursing facilities, they all had their own software and they were these like mini fortresses that didn't really speak to one another. And what's happening in healthcare is patients are moving from one setting of care to another, from a skilled nursing facility to a home health facility, for example. And as of a couple of years ago, there was no way for that data to be available or for those medical records to be transferred in an elegant way. And so we thought we would help solve that problem by creating more of an end-to-end platform that we're calling WellSky. And we actually pursued eight acquisitions over three or four years, really, again, buying the category leaders in each of those end markets. So the leader in hospice software, the leader in home health software. And through a lot of hard work, we put those companies together in partnership with our CEO, Bill Miller, and have created now an end-to-end platform for post-acute care that provides a lot of visibility to the industry to improve patient outcomes because you can now track a patient in a very analytical way as he or she moves across the healthcare system you know, outside of a hospital. So those are two that we're pretty proud of where we created companies that really look totally different from where we started. Yeah, it's fascinating because I think when one, at least those familiar with the private equity industry, when one thinks of TPG, one may not be thinking about how you really formulate these ideas uh, from the ground up and build them out. Thinking back on the history, I believe TPG had incubated the idea and started uh, Hotwire, if I have that correctly, decades ago. And the examples you give are also, you know, incredible how you really first start with this theme, this thesis, and then play that out. You know, there's one thing to say about strategy, the other execution. You have a fantastic team to help you integrate these companies and go through that whole process of forming one company out of eight. Right. I guess on the operation side, are they involved from the get-go? Yeah, absolutely. One of the hallmarks of TPG from the beginning has been our ops team and our operating capabilities. We've tended to invest in situations that require more change. And even our initial deal as a firm, you know, buying Continental Airlines out of bankruptcy was probably, you know, a 10 out of 10 in terms of complexity and and difficulty turning around an airline. But it kind of speaks to the capabilities that we have internally around driving change at companies. And what's great is it doesn't have to be a distressed airline purchase to get us interested. I mean, we can very much invest behind growthy areas in a software business model, but utilize our operating capabilities in different ways. And so M&A integration, as you pointed out, has been a really important aspect of our work in software because so much of our investing has been driving consolidation. And as you know, it's easy to buy things. It's a lot harder to integrate them well. And um, we've had significant help from our operating team at both of those companies and many others in order to drive that uh, sort of work. The other thing I'd mentioned from an operating standpoint that we're proud of is many private equity firms now, as you know, have operating teams. I would say most of them tend to focus on improving margins, either by taking out costs or through other means. We do that too, but we've tended to focus more on driving increased revenue growth as a means to value creation. We find that to be harder to do. It's always easy to let people go and execute on a rip and improve margins. What's harder is how do you take a company that's growing two or 3% and make it grow 10 or 12%. And what we've been able to do in in a few instances is just that. And the great part about it from an investment standpoint is you get the higher earnings because you're driving more revenue, but you also get a higher exit multiple because the market in in most sectors and definitely in software, there's a high correlation between how quickly you're growing and the multiple that you get on your earnings. And so from our standpoint, we're very focused on driving 
revenue growth and our ops team has a number of playbooks that they use uh, to drive that at companies. And so got it. Maybe to close out, we could talk a little bit about the current environment. Everyone's trying to think through how COVID will impact either their own business or the broader business community and macro environment. How has it played into your thinking of how you're going to invest or how you approach existing portfolio investments? It's a really great question, RJ. It's the question of the year, really, for all of us. I think we've been really fortunate in software in that from a portfolio standpoint, our portfolio has done actually quite well during COVID. Most of our software companies are 80, 90, 100% recurring revenue. And so even where there are some customer and market hiccups, our companies have held in there quite well because of that business model. But I'd say even more sort of tellingly, what we're seeing across the themes that I mentioned is COVID is actually accelerating a lot of those themes. If you take security, for example, we're all working from home, we're working on our kids' iPads or out of the office. And so that whole trend around moving from perimeter-based security to cloud-based security went from sort of a, you know, let's do that over the next five years and kind of get there as a company to, man, we have to do that next two months or else everyone working from home won't be protected. So that's one great example where it's a theme that we were already pursuing and it just got accelerated. So the companies that we own actually benefited. There's a lot more dynamism now in the market that's creating investment opportunities. The other one I'd mentioned is back on the DevOps or digital transformation area. I think we're seeing this everywhere where brick and mortar businesses need to write their own software to engage with customers because they're not seeing customers come in their door. Or restaurants aren't seeing customers eat in. And so there's a need to write their own software to create mobile apps, to enable digital commerce, to allow for remote customer service. And so that whole theme around providing the tooling for Fortune 500 companies to write their own software and become digitally enabled you went from, again, like a five-year project to like a five-week project in many cases. So we've been really fortunate. The themes we've been focused on have been sort of net beneficiaries of COVID and our portfolio just by nature of the revenue model has been pretty insulated. So we're excited about where things stand and the prospects for 2021. Great. Well, Nahal, thank you uh, so much again for taking the time. I know our audience will find this very insightful. Thanks, RJ. Take care.